All right, so thank you everyone for joining for this talk. Um, it's my pleasure, my name is Wesley, it's my pleasure to announce the speaker today. Um, our speaker is Kristen Rodriguez. Um, Kristen Rodriguez is a PhD and is a highly successful K-12 administrator and college professor with 20 years experience in the field of education. Um, Kristen is the founder of Rodriguez Educational Consulting Agency and has presented nationally on leadership and learning for the past 15 years. Dr. Rodriguez spe specializes her consulting in the application of universal design for learning in the field of educational leadership. The book she co-authored, Universally Designed Leadership, um, from CAST Publishing, is the premier title for implementing UDL and systems in schools. Dr. Rodriguez has been the re recipient of numerous honors, including the Anson International Research Award from Boston University, and Kristen spent her childhood living internationally in Europe, Africa, and Asia. She now resides in Massachusetts with her husband and children. I'll go ahead and pass it on to her for the rest of the talk. So give her a round of applause. It's uh, not awkward at all when they read the bio that they ask you to write for yourself, right? Is the sound good? Yeah, excellent. So I'd like to welcome all of you to Universally Designed Leadership. I want to do one quick take of the room just to see how many of you are practicing administrators and how many of you are aspiring administrators or just teacher leaders who are interested in the field of uh, leadership. So if you are uh, currently an administrator, if you could just raise your hand. Most of you are there. Um, and aspiring leaders? Teacher leaders? All right, great, wonderful. So most of you are practicing administrators. So my purpose behind this, having been an administrator for uh, many years, was to make this very practical, to give you a couple of uh, tools and resources and, and um, uh, templates that you could bring back to your district and use. So it should be a very uh, concrete, useful uh, session for you. And if not, call me on it. Um, so really what we're doing here is we're looking at how do you apply the principles of universal design for learning to your leadership practices. How many of you have thought about UDL in relationship to leadership? So a couple of you have already started to think about that. So what I might do is I might call upon anyone that's had some practice in these areas to share some other examples beyond what I'm going to share uh, for my colleagues uh, around the state of Massachusetts. So we're going to do a quick Kahoot. So go into kahoot.it on any browser. I'm sure you've probably seen Kahoot here at the conference before. How many of you have not seen Kahoot before? So just a few of you have not seen Kahoot. Everything I share with you is free because I know none of us have any money in our districts. So Kahoot.it uh, uh, is a free online uh, survey, quiz mechanism. It's your teachers uh, will use it um, in their classrooms. What's going to happen is a question's going to show up on the screen. There's going, you're not going to see on your device, and I'll give you the game pin in just a minute, um, you're not going to see the question. You're going to just see shapes that, that correspond with the answers. OK, there's your game pin. How many of you use the Kahoot and you get annoyed with the sound after like four seconds like me? Right, it's really cute for the first few seconds and then I'm gonna lower it down. So we're just gonna see, and, and by the way, I often do trainings in schools where kids walk by, so I'm like, be super careful about the nickname you use, but here, go crazy. Oh, actually, it's being recorded, don't go crazy. Don't, uh, it's streaming, so don't go too crazy, but we're all adults. I have got to learn that technique afterwards. Please help me because it's annoying. Are all of us almost in? That was fast. Raise your hand if you want me to wait another second. OK, so let's get started. So what would be your worst nightmare for this session? Can you all see the screen, or do you need me to read? You can see. So uh, red is Rodriguez reads every PowerPoint slide. Blue is forced mingling. 
uh, yellow, non-concrete. It's a forced decision. What do they call it in politics? A binary decision. Uh, not quite binary. We've got four. And uh, yellow, uh, green is irrelevant subject. And you only have five seconds by the time I ended reading that. So, All right, let's see what your worst nightmare. Forced mingling. So I'll be sure to do that. <laughs> Excellent. I do read some slides. I apologize for that. I hope I'll give you some concrete examples. And if you're all leaders, this should be a pretty relevant subject for you. What's your tolerance for change? Are you freaking out about change? Blue, no problem. I'll just quietly keep doing what I'm always doing. No one will notice. When change happens, are you super psyched for it? You love to try new things? Or green, you're always interested but slightly skeptical about change. Not everyone's getting it in on time, but most of us have answered it. So this doesn't surprise me. I think a lot of the reasons we became leaders was because we're comfortable with change. We're usually very flexible people and we're excited for change and that's what drove us into leadership. We wanted to see some positive change happening in our schools or are in our districts. Uh, what I will let's what I usually say is you know one person's being honest because a lot of us say we're excited about change but then we quietly wait a little bit if we don't really buy into the change and see if it goes if it blows over. Um, so this is, a, this is a group that's fairly comfortable with it. And the reason I ask this question of you is because all of you, uh, I'm sure, are very successful, capable leaders. But I'm going to be pushing you a little bit today to be thinking about your own leadership practice and ways you can enhance that practice. It's not obvious at all that you're coming in. I know her. I'm just giving her a hard time. Um, by the way, this is Katie Novak. She's the co-author of the book uh, that we did. She's also written three other titles. Are we on three already? Yep, we're getting there. Uh, and so she's a great resource that we'll have in the session today as well. Uh, I'm happy to hear that you're willing to kind of think about this because all that work that you do as leaders pushing your educators to change their practice around UDL, I'm going to be asking you to do the same thing. I want you to push your own practice uh, utilizing the framework of universal design for learning. Last question. Just dipsticking. What's your understanding of UDL? So red, sit down lady. I could teach a class on UDL. Blue is I know of UDL, but I feel like I have a lot to learn still. Yellow is UD what? I have no understanding of UDL. So if this is your first day, that's good. If not, we'll work with uh, refreshing the slides. All right, so that's great. So we have no uh, early learners. That means that you've learned something from your uh, sessions this uh, week, which is fabulous. Uh, we have a couple of experts in the room, which is great. I'll be tapping into you. And a lot of you are saying, I understand UDL, I, but I still feel like I have so much to learn. So knowing that and knowing who was coming and I was on the last day, um, I didn't really build in a framework or scaffold of what is UDL. What does universal design for learning look like in practice? I made an assumption I could have gone back and review, but I don't think I will. But if at times as we engage in activities or conversation or discourse, you're struggling with any of the terminology or any of the concepts that we're exploring, um, please let me know and I can um, take a step back and make sure that everybody's on the right frame. So that's it. Thank you so much. I just wanted to make sure that if I steamroll ahead with an expectation that most of you know about universal design for learning, I wasn't losing anybody in the crowd. So I'm going to share uh, a few um, examples, conceptual examples, of universal design for learning, which you've probably seen before. But I want you, uh, whether metaphorically or physically, to turn your hat around. And instead of thinking about these things in terms of uh, doing these things for students, I want you to think about how you would engage in your practice to support staff. Okay. So when we think about these analogies that we often use around UDL, we always think generally first about kids. But I want you to think about adults. 
So let's look at this first one. This is a very popular one. Um, most of you probably have seen this cartoon. And I want us to think about this issue of equity. This concept of, to some degree, universal design for learning as an approach to um, social justice efforts, right? Making sure that we're meeting the needs of all students. And I want you to think about if you are not universally designing your practice, are you supporting all of your staff to have their greatest success? And if not, what's the impact of that in the classroom, getting back to those kids? So just think about those. And I want you to, in your mind, turn to a partner and think of an initiative that's going on right now in your building or in your district. And I want you to name that and then think about your staff and see who the fish is. Who has no way of being successful in the initiative that you're talking about? And then real briefly, just with a partner, why? So I'll give an example, a little scaffolding. We wanted to do online grading so our parents could access the grades a few years back. Most of the staff were on board, some were high flyers, and I had this nugget of uh, staff who just were pushing back at every turn. And when I met with each of them quietly, confidentially, and individually, it was a capacity issue, not an unwillingness. They did not know how to access the technology, for example. Or they were afraid of how to have conversations with parents when they saw the grades. They thought, they're all going to come at me, and I don't know how to answer their questions. Uh, they were intimidated by that, those conversations. So there was capacity building that we had to put in place in order for that initiative to be successful. So think about your fishes. Think about initiative, and turn and talk with a partner about just about that concept. I have this initiative, and I have a couple of these fishes. I think this is their issue. Mike will pick you up if you talk to me. <laughs> I know, so be careful. So I gave you absolutely not enough time, right, to have that conversation. But really, I wanted to just get your juices flowing and kind of activate your thinking around this concept. You probably could have this conversation for the next hour if we let it go on. Um, but I really wanted us to frame that concept that we do have staff that need choices and flexibility and scaffolding and mastery-oriented feedback, all those things that we offer to kids. We have to be purposeful in our planning. How many of us, a day before the faculty meeting, are like, oh my gosh, okay, we've got to get a meeting, let me get stuff together. And we're really not giving ourselves enough energy and time to universally design our work. And if we're not doing that, how can we expect, model, and evaluate our staff against those same principles? So a couple more, same concept. Have you seen this? Yep, OK. So what are those staff that need those sidewalk ramps? And how do we build those ramps in place so that everyone can get on board with what we need to do that's right for kids? And the easiest thing is, if you're new to UDL, that's a big upcoming initiative, potentially. If you're jazzed about it, you want to build that. How do you build capacity in your staff to be able to have success in that way? We've all seen this. How many of us are coming from districts that have gone from traditional to differentiated instruction? Right? And, and those kind of transitions, when we think about the differences between differentiated instruction and universal design for learning, not reacting when a student is struggling and intervening, but removing those barriers from the onset, I want you to think about how you can apply that same concept to your leadership practice. Remove those barriers from the onset. 
the time of when you meet with staff, the way you meet with staff, the way you engage with staff before or after you work with them. Think about removing those barriers for them. So just a few analogies just to get us started. So what does universal design for learning look like in administrative practice? I will tell you, I pretty much, this is, you know, you're up here listening to me, I haven't done anything different to the UDL framework except change the term students to staff. All of the principles, the guidelines, the checkpoints, they all work with adult learners. And if you've done any work on neuroplasticity, you know that the science tells you that adults have the capacity for great growth in learning as well. And I think sometimes we as leaders give up on certain staff at certain stages of either their career or their performance, where we say, mm, let's just kind of quietly walk them out. Let's make sure it goes smoothly. They're not, they don't have the capacity to be successful, which is kind of like giving up on a kid in your class. So I want to challenge that thinking in us as leaders and take responsibility for both the challenges and the successes of our staff and what we can do actively. Because regardless of whether that staff member uh, maintains or stays in the school, they're with those kids during the time that they're in your school and every single day, every single day is important for that kid. So you have to take that responsibility, just like we tell our staff to take responsibility for student performance, you have to take ownership as a leader how our staff perform. So um, this is us and the struggle is real. You are all crazy busy. I can't imagine what you're going to go back to on Monday, that you've been out for a few days on your own professional learning, the amount of emails, uh, crisis that you're going to have to pick back up. Um, a couple of us were joking, we're from the Northeast, oh my gosh, I didn't call a snow day or I had to call a snow day and all the ramifications of the, of the phone messages we're going to come back to. There is so much that goes on. Pretty much everything that happens, either in your building or in your district, is on your shoulders. And it's a huge responsibility. So how do you find the time to universally design your practice when you're so busy? I want us to think about that. Let me ask it a different way. Why should we spend the time, because there's a lot of prep time in UDL, right? Tons of prep time in UDL to get it right in terms of being thoughtful in your planning. When you have a million other things to do, why spend that time? Right, so, um, and I'm going to repeat some things I hear in the audience for those that are streaming in. So she was talking about, it's the same thing you would say to a teacher who would say that. I'm so busy, I have too much material and content to cover, I need to move on. And you would say, but if they don't get it that, you know, well that first time, it's going to be a lot more time in the end that you're going to be working. That struggling staff member or the resistance to any change, if you don't plan ahead of time, your response to that constant pushback is going to be as long, if not longer, than if you had some purposeful planning. I saw another hand. What a great statement. So she said, if you invest in that capacity in the beginning, it sustains you. Now, I was talking in a round table to a group of Florida administrators, and they were telling me that every three to five years, they're reassigned. In, in a lot of respects, the more successful you are, they were telling me, you get moved to other buildings because there's need. And, and so you're kind of spread around. And so we had this conversation about, well, I've only got three to five years. We talk about UDL implementation as like at least a five-year plan, probably four years before you see major impact or any significant impact. And they're saying, I don't have that time. And so part of our, my response was, but if it's not about you as the leader, and it's about building the capacity within your staff, you can leave. I left my district right now recently, and they are chugging ahead with UDL implementation because they understood, they were invested in it, they saw the outcomes and the positive nature, and it's not reliant on you. And I always say sometimes us as administrators, take off your cape. I'm actually going to put a cape on one of you later today. Uh, that's not just a prop, that's a prize. But we are superheroes in our own rights, but at the same time we need to learn to take off the cape and not uh, be the only one that's leading this change. We need to get that engagement early on. 
So here's an example. It's, you know, they say, don't put like three words on a slide, Kristen. I can't do it. I cannot do it. So my slides are super uh, text heavy, and I apologize for that. Uh, what I will say is they are all online. So if you go in my session, um, you could click on, and you can enlarge it, or you can uh, manipulate it if you want. Um, so if you go on the UDL and you click on my session, they're there. But these are the professional standards by the National Policy Board for Educational Administrators. These are the more recent ones that came out in 2015. And so one of the things I talk to administrators about is, just like we say with teachers, UDL is not another new initiative. Universal Design for Learning in our practice helps us become better practitioners in the work that we already have to do. So if we think about what is our work as administrators, and we're going to talk about some examples of that today, how can we use the principles of UDL to enhance our practice? So this is what the National Policy Board of Educational Administrators says is one thing that we need to do. Take a peek to read that blue. Can everyone read that blue? Any colorblind? Do I need to? Okay. I did have a colleague who was colorblind, and we always made sure, uh, a business manager, we always made sure that those, we had representations in colors that he could, um, he could access. So deliver actionable feedback about instruction and other professional practice. Down below, any other Massachusetts educators in the room? So in Massachusetts, we have uh, a rubric that all administrators have across the state. For the most part, every single one of us has the same rubric, same standards. They have one for superintendents, they have one for principals. Do all, a lot of you have common rubrics for your own evaluation? Do any of them look something like this, where they're talking about doing uh, classroom visits, providing targeted and instructive and constructive feedback? Anybody in this room not, ha not get evaluated on how they um, observe staff and teachers? So just one couple of you, but most of you, this is something that you have to do already, right? So why not universally design that practice? And I have some UDL experts, so before I click on the next slide, tell me uh, which aspect of UDL do you think I'm going to target around providing uh, constructive targeted feedback? Say it again, I heard it. Sustaining effort is actually a fabulous one. And then there's one about feedback. Who knows the actual term in UDL? Mastery yeah, mastery-oriented feedback. 8.4, checkpoint 8.4 of uh, the framework for UDL talks about providing and increasing our mastery-oriented feedback. It actually is for teachers giving that feedback to kiddos. This comes right from the expanded UDL guidelines. Have any of you seen this before? If you haven't, it's right on the CAST website. It's free. It just gives implementation examples for what these checkpoints look like in practice. I didn't change a word. I didn't change a word. And I want you to look at those examples of implementation around providing mastery-oriented feedback and think about the expectation of what you're supposed to do when you go in and observe a classroom and provide feedback for a teacher or observe a principal and provide feedback to that principal. Does any of this look like way off? Does any of it look like rocket science? Oh my gosh, I never thought about it. And a lot of people say, oh, I've, I do that. I do pieces of this in my own practice. You absolutely do. What most of us don't do is look at this framework as a whole and really reflect and plan around and for it on a consistent basis. So what I find is choose any one of these. Someone throw one out. Frequent, timely, and specific. So that's a huge, huge task to do. So generally you're in the classrooms. Do a lot of you do short, brief observations now? A lot of us have moved to those kind of like that Kim Marshall model. Someone was talking about Kim Marshall and that, you know, get in there. You're only there once out of like a thousand, ten thousand times, right? So if we're doing more frequent observations, what kind of feedback do we give? Is it specific? 
I'm asking because I think a lot of us are not because I read. I'm, one of the things that I do is I'm a state reviewer for the state of Massachusetts. We go out and we, uh, we review districts. Massachusetts high performing district, right? We're really proud of ourselves. We feel good about ourselves. And when I actually look at the feedback provided, it is very generic. And why? Because I have administrators across the state who have 30, 40, 50 plus people to observe. And they're just exhausted. They just don't have the time or capacity in only reacting to do it well. So in order for you to do that, you have to have some level of planning. You have to be thoughtful about that. You have to make sure you understand what those goals are for that educator. You have to know what their schedule is so you can hit some of the areas that they're targeting. You have to go in and look specifically at what the students are doing and what they're doing and provide specific feedback to them. And that's time consuming. But in the end, if you give mastery-oriented feedback that is not generic, that is specific, the outcomes will be much more um, successful for that educator. So it's time worth spent. So again, I'm not creating anything new to show you. I hope all I'm doing is adjusting your brain to say, I'm going to go back and look at that UDL framework, those guidelines, those principles, those checkpoints. And I'm going to sit down when I do my work, and I'm going to start to plan and respond according to those. I'm being thoughtful about those. So let's look at a generic faculty meeting agenda. One that we've all attended. <laughs> and I'm going to ask you to be very comfortable with yourselves. How many of us have actually uh, conducted a faculty meeting like this? If I'm the only one raising my hand, I, you were all liars. <laughs> all right, so if you've been around for a long enough time, you've done stuff like this, right? And a lot of us will say, oh, we've moved away. We've moved away from that. We do a lot of professional development. And I'm going to talk about the kind of professional development because, by the way, professional development faculty meetings, in my observations, sometimes looks like this. The principal standing in front of the teachers, giving a PowerPoint presentation on a topic of their interest, and then teachers complying or complaining. Right? And so there's very little investment. So I want to um, look at the sample administrative rubric language around faculty meetings. There are four ratings in our state. So you go from um, a, a rating of kind of unsatisfactory to needs improvement to proficient, which is where we're supposed to be, and then exemplary is, you know, you'd be coming to a, a state conference. That's how good you've got to be to get that rating, right? You're, you're just, you're killing it. Now, this is existing language of what the state tells us administrators should be doing when they're leading faculty meetings. And I want you to turn and talk, and I want you to think about what does this look like in practice? Pull from your own experience in, in, in uh, meetings that you've led or participated in, or if you haven't, flip what you've done and think about what you would have done differently or what you would have participated in differently to accomplish this. So this concept of engagement is very important. And engagement is very hard to assess, right? It's one of the hardest things that we have to assess. Super easy to assess compliance. Very difficult to assess engagement. And um, I, I steal this quote from Katie, and she's here so I can give her credit for it. I always say to her, what's that quote you say about engagement? What is that again? And it's equal parts attention and commitment. And I would say that a lot of our faculty meetings are missing one of those two. That concept of commitment as it relates to engagement means that those educators are participating not only in the activities within that meeting, but constructing the agendas, defining the work, designing the activities, and participating in them, as well as assessing them. That kind of construct leads to much better engagement than what we're doing right here where I'm talking and you're listening. I promise I'm going to model in a second. So talk to your partner and say, what does, you could choose proficient or you could choose exemplary. What does that look like to you? 
How would you picture that meeting running where the participants, let's say we go to proficient, where participants are engaged in a thoughtful and productive series of conversations and deliberations about important school matters. By the way, this is the only indicator in the Massachusetts uh, rubric that talks to staff meetings. The only one that relates to that. And what do they talk about? That you should be in your staff meetings focusing on deliberations around important school matters. And how do you get to exemplary? What's the difference there? You're creating solutions to instructional issues. That's how you become exemplary. You're engaging them in creating solutions to instructional issues. So turn and talk for just a moment about what that looks like to you. Are you give me a hard time? <gasps> all right, all right, yeah, keep going. Um, you gotta, you gotta take it up down. Your side angle's good. <laughs> now I know you're doing it. I can't. I can't. Um, thank you. So I'm going to bring us back. I hear great conversations. I really was trying to get someone to do interpretive dance, a skit, a uh, rap, but nobody was a taker. However, because I, you know, firm goals, flexible means, I don't care how you get there, just as long as you get there. I did get a group who was willing to share with us what that looks like to them. So if you don't mind sharing it, I'm going to uh, give you the mic. Can you shout? They, they like it for the... Uh, for the streaming. Go ahead. I'm near you, go ahead. Okay. Uh, so uh, we're from a district in Wisconsin, right outside of Madison, and um, as a high school principal, we had uh, contractually, you could have two hours a month for a faculty meeting, and we had traditionally done a half hour a week, and that really wasn't working for anyone, and it was a lot of what you talked about, compliance or complaining. And so we shifted that to um, department collaboration time led by department coordinators, focused on data and then solution-oriented action, and um, held that for twice a month, 45 minutes. Uh, the departments could set the time they wanted to meet before school, after school. Um, again, they created the agendas, they facilitated conversations, and administration would uh, um, just, they would come and, and sit in and, and help listen and, and 
guide and provide whatever support they could. And then our um, support staff, special education, reading teachers, ESL teachers, they would also try to get to as many of those meetings as they could so they could provide their lens on things. So it wasn't like just science teachers talking about science-oriented data, but maybe through the lens of an ESL teacher who could say, like, are you doing word walls for um, science vocabulary? Or how are you connecting um, some of the language goals into this work? So a lot of different perspectives, but it, anyway, it made that time so much more meaningful than what had been in place before. Are you willing to give up the control guys to do something like what she's talking about? And a lot of that means she has trust in her staff. She trusts that they're not going to waste their time. She trusts that they're going to be organized. She trusts them to have uh, the design. So there had to have been some foundational work that she had done to do that. And that's okay. You don't, your staff might not be right there yet. But why not get them there? It's the difference between walking into a chemistry classroom and seeing the students participating in a lab that the teacher designed, or walking into a physics classroom where the principals have been taught to them and they're designing their own experiment to demonstrate that. It's the same thing with your staff. Are you controlling it because you know what's best? and you're the harbinger of knowledge and information and you're leading the change? Or are you creating conditions for them to participate in that process so that if you walk away, come to a conference, get sick, you move on, that your staff is strong and independent enough to move forward with those, with those things? Did you have something to share? I was on the receiving end of a model just like that as a teacher. And we grew so much in our confidence in it was phenomenal how we took over the PLC and we grew in our confidence because before we, were, we weren't confident to make decisions and this happened for me in 2007. We lacked the confidence to make decisions and we lacked the confidence to trust ourselves and the decisions that we made. But he pushed us and he did exactly that because we had so little time. He stopped doing the faculty meetings, made us go to our department chairs and we split up and even the department chair leaders started picking many leaders among those groups. It was a phenomenal experience, and I think it's a huge reason why I'm in leadership today, <coughs> because that shift empowered me. I got chills for you. Decisions. That that Yeah, yeah, I say we give a round of applause. Thank you for sharing that as an educator, the impact that something like that has on you. And again, I just don't think that people aren't willing to give that opportunity to staff. I just don't know if we spent the time thinking about should we be doing it and how do we do that and planning for it so it can be successful. Because if you just throw that out there and you don't provide the scaffolding or the needs or the constructs or the supports or the flexibility, because what she said was it could be after school, it could be before school, a lot of administrators say, no, nope, this is it. It's one hour. You have to stay. Even if you're done with discussion, and wait five okay you can go right because they don't want the superintendent to walk in and realize that their, their staff left two minutes early so you know a well-run meeting the principal saying I, I know guys we got to keep you want to keep going but we're you know you can you can continue but just so you know if you have other arrangements you you're welcome you're welcome to go but you know it's so engaging that they're that they're uh, investing long periods of time so um, I know you could all read this uh, really well um, obviously, you can't read it, uh, but I'll read some of it to you. This is an example of uh, a, a, a faculty meeting that one of my colleagues in Tewksbury, Massachusetts designed when they were thinking about what they normally did traditionally and how they wanted to uh, manage change so that they could universally design their faculty meetings. And what I want to talk about is not only the aspects of creating an engaging meeting where groups of educators are learning together to create solutions for instructional issues, which by the way, if they're constructing it and they're involved in the design of it and they're participating in it, what network are you activating? You're doing multiple means of? They're of engagement through action and expression, right? Through multiple means of action and expression. So you're, you're, you're activating that engagement aspect when they're participating in the development and design, the goal setting, the action planning. They're, they're engaged in that. It becomes their work. So you're engaging them. And so what this is is uh, they had an activator. They were talking about growth mindset. Um, 
as a framework to be able to tackle some of the harder issues that they were engaged in. And they really wanted to say, how do we, and I adapted this a little bit for this activity, but the construct is, is theirs. How do we strengthen our understanding of the components of a university design classroom? And how do we identify best instructional practices in a video lesson demonstration? And so those, that was the objective for, the, um, for there. Notice key vocabulary and concepts. Right, so they articulated those key vocabulary and concepts. They stated the objective. In the activities, you'll see that there's, there's gradual release of responsibility in this one uh, faculty meeting. Uh, participating in discussion around key concepts and vocab, everyone getting on the same plane, everyone's together, led by the administrator. Then they gave a graphic organizer uh, around engagement in the classroom, and they looked at a lesson together, a video lesson. And then they did a breakout session to identify best practices related to those key vocabulary areas. So they whole group, then they did small group, and they discussed it. And then their exit ticket was to list one to three strategies that individually they wanted to implement in their classrooms. So even in one lesson, that was a swift gradual release of responsibility, right? But it existed. In addition to that, they were thinking about making sure that the agenda itself was accessible. This is not accessible to most of you. I know that, right? So I'm not modeling it very well, but they're modeling it. What do they do? They use multiple media for communication. They use multiple tools for construction and composition. They had Google Forms, right? Uh, they had chart paper. They had those videos for the multiple media. And they built fluency with graduated levels of support for practice and performance. Did I make those up? No. Did they make those up? Nope. That comes right from the one pager that we all get around the UDL guidelines. Right? So when you take that as a framework and you say, I'm going to use this in my planning. I'm preparing an agenda. I'm going to take that uh, one pager out or the expanded guidelines. And I have a couple of uh, paper copies, if anyone uh, ha doesn't have it, it's really small to read. There's uh, obviously uh, an electronic version, but if you're kind of new to this and you want to take a peek at this, you would take this sheet with you and you put it there when you're doing your planning and you check yourself on that. Now, will you be able to make sure that every single checkpoint on this is done? No, nope, nope. But make sure that you're varying your attention to different checkpoints, different guidelines, right? Different standards. You should make sure that all standards are um, thought about in your planning. And you should be overt in the planning document where you're doing that with staff to model it for them. So I'm going to share with you a couple of examples of agendas that I've used where we've done that. So what you're going to do is I have prizes. I really spent a lot of like resources and money at the dollar store on my prizes. I just want you all to know that. Um, what you're going to do is you're going to read a sample agenda. There are two sample agendas available to you online. And if you don't have access to the internet or you don't want to toggle back and forth, I have paper copies that you can come and get. And I'm going to put these paper copies in the back of the room. Also, if you don't have a writing utensil, because I'm actually uh, going to have you use traditional paper and pencil for this activity, there are pens that I made sure were there, enough probably for us in the back of the room. And what you're going to do is you're going to get into uh, groups of about three, because that's as many prizes as I have, three to four. Let's see, one, two, yeah, groups of I wouldn't go more than three, because I think you want to have a conversation. Get into groups of three. I want you to read the sample agenda. Some of them, if you go online, have an audio version. I always record my agenda for staff um, beforehand. I use free resources to do that. And um, I record it, and I put it as a link on the agenda. And some of them, when they're writing home, or their eyes are tired, it's been a long day, they've been looking at a screen or whatnot, it gives them an opportunity to hear the agenda. And hear my voice, it kind of comes to life a little bit for them as well. So both of them have uh, audio versions, and I try to do that with my faculty meetings. So you're going to read uh, or listen to the sample agenda, 
and you're going to complete my scavenger hunt. My scavenger hunt and is uh, just checkpoints from the UDL guidelines, right? So we've got the three standards, the nine guidelines. There's roughly three checkpoints or so under each guideline. So it's just those checkpoints, those finer tuned versions. And you're going to find in the agenda where those are accessible. The purpose of this is to see how it looks in practice, but also to see, is it obvious enough? Your teachers should be able to complete the scavenger hunt on your own agendas, even potentially if they don't have a deep knowledge of UDL. Because what I try to tell administrators is, do it yourself first, model it, show them how engaging it is, show them how fun it is, show them how much they learn, show them how much time they accomplished through this. They're going to want to do this themselves. It's a real motivator for them to engage in it. So groups of two to three, I'm going to give you each a um, paper version, pens, and uh, paper versions of the agendas are there. They're also online for you. The person, the group that literally runs to me first and delivers, I mean, I'm a little competitive, so I enjoy this. If you're not, I apologize. This is forced mingling, by the way. I told you I was going to do it. So um, you're going to get with a group. You're going to complete this, and then you're going to run it over to me. The person, uh, the team that gets first gets my prize. And by the way, if you're looking at the cape, the cape is for a Twitter all-star. So throughout the core, throughout the, the, the session, you could be tweeting, and I'm going to just skip ahead because I want to show you what the hashtag is. I want you to tweet it to me at Dr. Underscore Rodriguez 21, and I want you to put the hashtag UDL and UD Lead. Take a photo if you need to of that hashtag. Uh, write it down if you need to, because through the course of the session, I'd love to see some tweets. And then at the end, we're going to look online, and participants are going to like the best tweets that they see out there. And the tweet that has the most likes gets the cape and gets, their, gets to wear their cape with pride that they had the strongest tweet of what they learned in today's session. Or it might not be new learning, but it made you think, something you reflected upon in your practice, OK? So that was a lot of information. So I'm going to go back and just refresh. Read the sample agenda. Complete the scavenger hunt. Bring it back to me. Get a prize. Don't get it in time. You got new learning anyway. All right. So I apologize that I'm doing this in order so that people on this side seem to be getting a, a bit of an advantage. <laughs> I know that's what people are thinking. I'm going to put two on this row just in case. You don't have to work with the people in your row if you don't want to, but you're welcome to. You're welcome to move around. I'll give you a couple. The agendas are on the back table. I don't have an agenda per person, but if you can't access online and you want a paper copy, there are um, a couple of them. So the agendas are not meant for everybody. They're just if you can't get online or you prefer to have them in paper. So don't feel worried if you don't have one. You've got it online. You helped. room so um, just if uh, not for the people here but if you're streaming and you want to participate in this activity uh, you go into canvas you can use that URL or you can sign up you can you can access the same materials uh, that the participants have You could put the times, you could say the, the, the title, the header, whatever, wherever you find it. There's two agendas, which one I said you could choose either one. Oh, either, one. Oh. either one that you want. Whichever one is easier for you to access. Some like longer agendas, some like shorter, so you have two options.
You got to run it up. I think we might have a winner, winner, chicken dinner. And you can assume that there's not always just one example. Toma. <laughs> uh, we have one set of winners. I'm looking for one more set. I have up to three more prizes. Qué bueno. Are you all close? Is it like bingo where I'm like one number away and like half the room is only like one number? Everybody. Come on. <laughs> Yep. My handwriting is terrible. Learning questions after we discuss. Ready? I'm a terrible answer. Ooh, that was good. All right, let's have a round of applause for the sets of winners. And you know what? You're all winners. You're all winners. Because uh, now you have two practical examples of universally designed agendas, and you've had a little time to kind of play with what does that look like in practice. Um, for those agendas that you looked at, pretty obvious, pretty overt, for the most part where things were just took a little time to digest. One of the agendas was much longer. Can you guess who wrote that one? <laughs> and one was much more succinct. So uh, I thank you. Hold on. Feel free to hold on to this. If you're interested, I do have an online version of this that I use, um, a Google Form version of the scavenger hunt that I use, um, that I do with groups. And if you wanted it, you'll have my contact information. I can send it out. It's just a fun kind of activity to do with your, with your colleagues. Um, and obviously, it's not every single checkpoint. It's just a couple of ones that were uh, available on those samples. So um, real quick. We talked a lot about faculty meetings. We've talked about faculty meetings being opportunities for professional development, but we haven't really talked too much about professional development. And because I'm an over planner, we don't have tons of time left to do that. But I want to highlight a few key things for you to think about. When we think about professional development, again, similar to faculty meetings, the one area that I see missing in our planning as leaders often is the concept of focusing on the engagement of our faculty, staff, colleagues in whatever we offer to them. We think, well, I'm the PD provider. I'm the facilitator. It's my responsibility to do this. I'm going to give you this information. Yet we don't think of that in the classroom, which is the same kind of a learning environment. right? We'd say to teachers, no, 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 that's not your role anymore. Your facilitator of learning. So we need to reframe ourselves thinking about we're facilitators of learning. Do you have a self-assessment and reflection mechanisms built into your PD? And I'm talking about self-assessment and reflection not of you as a PD provider, but for your participants. Are you asking them what their needs are? Are you engaging with them to understand what priorities are in their own practice and learning? How is that embedded into your formal process? Do you allow people to reflect on what they've learned? Is it one and done? Or are there opportunities to practice what they've learned, to come back, to explore it, to unpack that learning? And do you collect feedback at the end? And if you're an administrator, they're freaked out by giving you feedback sometimes, no matter how comfortable you are with them, because you are their evaluator. And so we always give multiple options for that feedback. Sometimes I do it outside of the meeting and I send it as a follow-up. Sometimes I do it in. 
a lot of people think that we can um, tag them through electronic surveys, so I always give an option. What I always say to my staff is, I know your handwriting. Like, I know that better than a, an IP address. Like, but whatever you're comfortable with, however you're comfortable, right? Come talk to me and give me feedback. Use an electronic survey and give me feedback. Do an exit ticket, feel free to do it that way. Write it out on paper. I don't care how you give me feedback, just please give me feedback so that I know you're getting out of it, you're using what it is, and how can I improve? With new initiatives, what are those barriers for your staff? Are you thinking about those barriers when you're designing PD? If technology is a barrier, and you know you're going to be doing a tech-based PD, do you offer uh, sessions beforehand, ahead of time, small groups surrounding that, to give them the capacity to access the training? I bet you most of us don't. We might do follow-up when they freak out or they're not willing to do it, but do we think about it in our planning? Do we think about removing that barrier during the session? Do we partner them up? Do we give them an easier access format to participate in it? Or do we just do everything the same for everyone? I think a lot of us do the same for everyone. Um, are you thinking about um, making sure that they understand the research and information behind why you're engaging in this professional development, or is it just your initiative? Did they participate in that? And again, anticipating those challenges and providing coping opportunities for your staff. I'm only going over engagement. We could do the whole thing on how do you do multiple means of representation? How do you engage in multiple means in action expression? Those are kind of easier to some degree. I used video, I used audio. Check. But really, am I making sure that they care about this work? Harder to accomplish. That's why I focused on this, because you're a little of an advanced group. So thinking about that, what attracts their attention? Their kids, their own learning, success, that attracts it. What is it? Whatever it is. Think about attracting that attention. And remember, think about sustaining that attention once you've attracted it. How do you sustain their attention? How is this work meaningful? Remember how we talked about the three guidelines? I'm sorry, the three uh, principles and the nine guidelines. And what is the one uh, principle that we used to do last in our planning when we thought about it? Yeah, and remember how they switched, they flipped the chart for us to say, don't forget about that? Start with the why. Why are we even doing this? Why am I, why am I taking their time to do this today? Because their time is valuable, value their time. And um, this question is, if this concept of why is done well, you're not going to have the parking lot conversations that inevitably follow that, why do we have to do this? This is, oh my gosh, I'd rather be planning right now. I don't want to be doing this. Right? We've all walked past and everyone got quiet. They're talking about me. Um, and part of that is they don't see you value their time. And so you really want to value that and begin with the why. She prompted me. She's like, you have a minute. So we're not going to have time for this last activity, but I wanted to share it with you uh, as something that you can reflect on as you leave. And that is, if we are expected to develop workplace conditions and other professional opportunities for teachers, by the way, not just teachers, all staff. If your professional development activities are only for core classroom teachers, that's about 20, 30% of your overall staff, those, just those core subject areas, or if in elementary school it's more, but it's not everyone. You need to provide professional development for everyone, opportunities for everyone. If you're doing that, you need to promote effective PD practice around student learning. What I was going to have you do was think about a topic that you want. It could be universal design for learning. It could be whatever you're doing, project-based learning, growth mindset, whatever those things are that you're working on that's important to your uh, school, to your staff. And I was just saying, just prompting you with two checkpoints. There's so many more that you want to be thinking about. But just for purposes of this afternoon, prompting you to think about Am I offering choices? Do they have autonomy of when we meet, how we meet, what we meet about? Are those choices inherent? And when we're participating in those meetings, are they actively participating? Are there concepts of exploration occurring? Are we letting them get their um, roll up their sleeves and get messy a little bit? 
struggle, productive struggle during that opportunity for PD, feeling comfortable with failure so they can grow, exploration and experimentation. Are we as leaders allowing a culture and a construct that allows in our professional development for choice, autonomy, active participation, exploration, and experimentation? And if the answer is not yet, the solution would be to sit down individually if you're capable, collectively if you're not ready and you're not there yet, and unpack the guidelines and think about how you can design your work so that would be a result. And there's a lot of people in this room who do these things very well. There's a lot of colleagues across the country. And the reason I wanted to put you into that hashtag is the UD lead is a new one I just started using. So educators across the country who are interested in applying universal design for learning to their leadership practices can get to know each other, can follow each other, can create a new PLN. So I thank you so much. Um, any specific questions, clarifying questions, or or really philosophical questions I don't have time to answer because I ran over. So I thank you. Thank you guys very much. Um, voting on the Twitter, if you want to stick around and uh, have your tweets get voted, voting will be closed in two minutes. So go on to UD Lead, hashtag UD Lead. I'm going to pull it up. At two minutes, voting will close, and the winner will be given their cape.